This is Math 156, Lesson 6. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is some arithmetic. Uh, if you have a real number, so let's say x is equal to Seventy-six point one two nine, very nice number. What we call the integer part of x is the largest integer n. less than or equal. No greater than x. And this is also called the floor of x. And the maple command is floor. Floor of x. And that's 76. This number is between 76 and 77. So the largest integer less than or equal to 76, 0 0.129 to 76. We take the floor of pi, pi is 3.14. You have to use a capital letter P when you're writing the constant pi. So what's the greatest integer less than or equal to pi? It's three. what is called the fractional part of x is what you get when you subtract off the floor of x. This is in the interval from zero to one. <clears throat> it could be zero, but it's less than or equal to one. So for example, and the command for the fractional part is frac. So the fractional part of, um, I don't know, well, 76.129 is 0 0.129. You take the number, subtract away the integer part of it, and you're left with something between zero and one. If you take an integer, like 76, the integer part is 76. And the fractional part of 76 is zero. So let's look at something a little bit more exciting. Suppose I take um, three halves. And um, so I don't have to keep writing three halves, I'll call this A. So A is three halves. What's the fractional part of three halves? one half. What's a squared? Uh -huh. What's the fractional part of a squared? A fourth. What is a cubed? 27 over eight. What's the fractional part of 27 over 8. 3 eighths. You know, it's actually more interesting to see these numbers as decimals. So if instead of writing A as 3 halves, let me write A as 1.5. Because if a number is expressed as a decimal, when you calculate everything, you get the result as a decimal. So the fractional part is 0.5, a squared is 2.25, that's the fractional part. That's the fractional part of 
oops, this should be the fractional part of a cubed, small, and so forth. Now, let's take, uh, I'm sort of curious about these fractional parts. They're always between zero and one, um, but how are they distributed? So let's just look for, let's say, n from 1 to 20 do. And what I want to do is compute the fractional part of a to the power n. So this will be a number from between 0 and 1. Let me write n comma that so I'll know which n I'm looking at. Uh-huh. <coughs> So these are the fractional parts of the powers of three halves. And they sort of jump all around in this interval. And maybe I would like to know just the ones that are between zero and a half. So, so let me write the following loop. For n from 1 to 20 do, if, if the fractional part of a to the power n is less than 0 0.5, then print n. And I have to end my end if, my if with an end if comma. So now this is a loop. We're just going to give me all the ends for which the fractional part is in the first half of the interval. And I get, well, how many are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, three, six, no, nine, nine. It's almost half, that's interesting. Suppose I go up to 100. Uh-huh. These are all the ends, which the fractional part, how many are there? Um, wow, it looks like almost all of them from some point on. I'm very suspicious about that. Let me do two things. Let me write out the fractional part of a to the n. Let me erase this for the moment. So I'm just going to look at the fractional parts of the first hundred numbers. Yeah. Something is not right here. And if they can't be zero from some point on. Oh, no, it can't be. Oh, I know what's going on. <coughs> it 
these numbers have gotten so big that it's like bigger than the bigger than the computer can handle actually that's interesting um, let me change the number of digits let's see if that does something so you can change the number of digits on display in maple fine let's say we go to digits of length 30. Yeah, that seems to be a little bit better. Let's see if I can now count the number of powers of three halves whose fractional part is between zero and a half. Hmm. How many are there from up to, I don't want to have to count them all. This is the list of all the integers n from one to a hundred where when you raise three halves to the power n and look at the fractional part, it's in the first half of the interval. And I don't want to have to count them by hand. So let me figure out a way to write a maple program that will count them for me. So let's do this. Suppose n is going to be the number and I start off by setting n equal to zero. And now, I should, well, I'll use a different letter. I'll just call it, let's say, um, uh, L. So L is set equal to zero. And now n goes from one to 100. And every time you have a number n who's such that a to the n, one half, three halves to the n is less than a half, instead of printing out n, let me just, replace L, so I assign to the, the new value of L will be the old value plus one. So I've added so L was counting the number of powers of three halves whose fractional part is less than a half. And let me just at the end print out L. Let me see if this works. Is printing out all the L's all wrong, but let me use a colon instead of a semicolon. Oh, I actually I put this L in the wrong place. That's what I had. And if, and then at the very end, write L. Let's see if this does it. Ah. 51. So this says that 51 out of 100 numbers have the fractional part between in the interval from zero to a half. Let me go up to 1,000, 1,000. That's a big calculation. Um, let's see what happens. Oh, that was great. 715. That's surprising. See, when I went up to 100, I had 51. If I go up to 200, I have 100 lot. That's curious. When I go up to 300, it looks like it's always about half. 400 is 195, 500, 600, 700, now it's suddenly way off. 
And at this point, I'm getting suspicious about my computer. Hmm. Okay. Let me go back and setting the number of digits equal to 10 again, which is the default in Maple. So let's do a simpler program. Suppose we want to count the number of prime numbers up to 100. So we could say as follows, well, if you just wanted to list the primes, so let's say, let's change it. List the primes. Okay, so that's easy. You can say for n from 1 to 100 do if is prime of n, then print n. And if. And do. Ah, let's just go back. So is prime is a Boolean command. It always gives you the value which is true or false. So is prime of n is true if n is prime and false if n is not prime. So for all these numbers from one to 100, Maple checks all the numbers and it just prints out all the ones that are prime. Let's change the problem. Suppose we want to count the number of primes from up to 100. So again, we can do that. We can give ourselves some counting variable. Let's call it k. I'll set k equal to zero to start. And now as you run from one to 100, every time you have a number that is a prime, you assign a new value to k, namely the old value k plus one. And at the very end, if I print out k, that'll be the answer, 25. So I could have counted all these. Let's see, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, yeah, 25 when I count them up. Of course, if there are like a thousand numbers, I don't want to count them up by hand. That's too hard, but Maple just did it. In fact, if I want to know how many primes up to 10,000 there are, it turns out to be 1229. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, it's very interesting. So I just wanted to show you how to construct a loop in which you count something instead of just printing out a result. Um, let's do, um, something in calculus. Implicit differentiation. So you might have some polynomial or some function of x and y, like x squared plus y squared equals one. Oops, I guess I assigned a value to y at some point. So let me go back and erase everything from my memory. It's like we're starting with a new worksheet. So we know this is a circle. And y is defined as a function of x. And we want to find dy dx. But we don't want to have to solve this equation. We could, but we don't want to. So there's an, a command called implicit diff. And if you take this equation, Now this defines y as a function of x. It also defines x as a function of y. If you wanna know what dy dx is, if you think of this as defining a function y, 
then you say you want y comma x. That means find the derivative of y with respect to x. And the answer is minus x over y. This is the derivative. Now let's just check. Um, from this equation, if you solve for y, you would actually get y equals um, the square root of one minus x squared. Plus or minus actually, but um, so here y is explicitly a function of x. Um, if we take this expression and we want to differentiate, when you have a, a function, if, when you don't have an expression, not a function, this is just a, an expression. If I want to differentiate this expression with respect to x, I get this. Now, I claim these two are the same. Why are they the same? Because y is equal to this. You replace this y by this, you get exactly this. So you can see that this is correct. You might say, well, I didn't really need to do implicit differentiation because I could solve for y in terms of x. But if I have an equation where I can solve for y in terms of x, like for example, x cubed minus five times cosine of x times y equals 17. <coughs> Oops. I don't know. Um, I would have had a mistake here because I had previously defined y to be this. So now when I want to start afresh, I have to erase that y from the memory, which I can do by clicking on this circle right here. And that's okay. So now this really is y again. So y is some function of x, but I don't know if I could actually solve this for y. Oh, maybe I could, let me make it more complicated. Um, Yeah, now this I know I couldn't solve for y. But let's see if it's impossible to get a derivative for this. Ooh, that's too hard. So I'll go back and make it what it was in the beginning. That one's not so hard. Hmm. I wonder why it doesn't want to do that. Oh, I misspelled it. That's the problem, I think. There we are. So this should have been okay. Whatever was the previous one should have been okay. Maple doesn't know what you intend. It only knows what you write. So let's see if this more complicated expression can be differentiated. Wow. So that is the derivative. This. This, oh, I may make this a y. That's much more interesting. Much more complicated, too. All right, wow. So this equation defines some sort of curve in the plane. And at any point on the curve where y is a function of x, this is the derivative. Now, could we actually see what this curve is? So 
for that, there's a command implicit plot. So in Maple, there are a lot of plotting commands. The one we've been using, plot, we just use. But the other plotting commands are collected into some package and you have to open the package in order to be able to use anything uh, in the package. The way you open a package of commands in Maple is to use the command with. If you want to use Maple with something, it's with and then this package is called plots. So when you, I've now opened the plot command and there are all sorts of additional kinds of plotting I could do. There's animation, 3D animation, a lot of things. And one of them is implicit plot. So let's just see. Let's start with an example where we know the answer. Implicit plot. Suppose we have the circle x squared plus y squared equals one. We want to plot this curve and we have to give a range of values for x and y. Like maybe x goes from minus one to one and y goes from minus one to one. There it is. So we're just graphing this curve. Suppose I made this more interesting. Suppose I made this, let's say, two times x. And notice this is drawn to scale. One is the, the length of one and the vertical and horizontal axes are the same. Let me make this two. Let's see what it looks like. Uh-huh. It still looks like a circle, but it's not a circle. You can tell first because you know this is the equation of an ellipse. And second, one unit this way is the same as about 0.7 units the other way. So to really see this thing, what this thing really looks like, let me click on this if I can figure out how to make this. Yeah, I need to get my menu for graphing. There it is. I don't know why it comes up and doesn't. Scaling constraint. If I click on that, now this is drawn to scale. If I made this seven, that's what this ellipse looks like. Suppose I put in something interesting like, I don't know, three times X times Y. Now, it would be hard to guess what the graph of this looks like. Let's look. Oh, what is that? Well, I guess we didn't go far enough in either direction. Let me go from minus two to two in both directions and see what happens. Ah, so this is drawn to scale. And this is an ellipse. Let me rotate it a little bit. Let me make this 13. I'm sort of curious. Ah, this looks like it's a parabola. Sorry, a hyperbola. Let me. Um, Make this a little bigger. Huh. Yeah, that is definitely a hyperbola. Hmm. So somehow changing this coefficient of x, y in the middle turned the ellipse into a hyperbola. Let's look at a series of these things. How do I look at a series of things? Let's say for n from, um, I don't know, minus five to five do. I would like to write my n do before I forget. And what I want to do is plot 7x squared plus n times xy. Let's make it minus 4 to 4 in this direction. I'm not sure what's going to happen, but we'll see. Yeah. So we should get 11 graphs. Ooh. 
So at minus five, see these things are not drawn to scale. Now it's drawn to scale. Okay, now these are all drawn to scale. So you have, see the, oh, you have an ellipse. So here we are. Um, no, let's go back. This is our loop from n going from minus five to five. So an ellipse, it's rotating, it seems. And Let's look at more pictures. Suppose I go from minus 15 to plus 15. I mean, to do this by hand would be hopeless. But with a computer, it's fantastic. You just get all this work done for free. Ooh, I could dance. Let's look at this again. They're not drawn to scale, but you can see we start with a hyperbola, 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 a lot of hyperbolas. Then that jumps to ellipses. Ellipses, hyperbolas again. You can really do a lot of mathematical experiments with this. It's quite lovely. Okay. Um, so let's put together the two things we've learned and try to do the following. Construct the tangent line to a curve defined implicitly by an equation and <clears throat> plot the curve <clears throat> and the line on the same graph. That's our mission. So let's see, we have all these pretty curves. Let's take one which maybe is an ellipse, let's see. Um, Let's pick a value of n like, I don't know, three. So this is just plotting this particular curve and we get this ellipse. And 
And there it is drawn to scale. So on this ellipse, let's say at the point a quarter, what is the slope of the tangent line? So So we have the curve defined by this equation. And by implicit differentiation, so we use the command implicit diff, and we want the derivative of y with respect to x. This is what we get. So let me call this something. I'll call this, um, I don't know, say a. So a is this expression. So at any point x, y on the curve, That's the slope of the tangent line. Maybe I should actually call this M. So at any point X, Y on the curve, this is a slope of the tangent line. So on this curve, what is X equal, what is Y equal to when X is a fourth? So let's see, suppose I let x equal a fourth, 0 0.25. Let me just do it the hard way. Let me just plug this in itself to see. 0 0.25 squared, three times 0 0.25. It's this quadratic equation. And suppose I want to, let's say, F solve this equation for Y. Uh -huh. So I get two solutions. So when X is a quarter and Y is either minus 1.2 or 0 0.463, well, the line one quarter cuts the curve in these two points, one on top and one on the bottom. Let me call this uh, B. So for example, B2 is the second one of these numbers. Oops, why is that? Let's see, oh, equal sign. So this is the point B2. And let's say that A, if I assign a value to A, A was a quarter. And this is M. So at any point on the curve, this is the slope. So if A is a quarter and B is this, if X is a quarter and B is this, this will give me the slope of the tangent line to the curve at this point. So let's see, let's substitute, SUBS is the command to substitute. Let's substitute x equals a and y equals b2 into oops, well, into m. So let's see if that works. Uh -huh. So according to this, at the point on the curve on top where x is a quarter, this is the slope of the tangent line. Let me just call this C, say. So my tangent line, I have to, is going to be the equation y equals C times x minus a plus b2. This is the point slope formula. Mm. We should have a time sign there. Ah, oh, there we are. So this is the tangent line. Let's just see if this is correct. Let's 
So here, I plotted the ellipse. Let me do it to scale. And now, in addition to the ellipse, I want to plot the tangent line. So I have to put that in curly brackets. And let's see if this works. Perfect. There's the ellipse, and there is the line. Let me just not go up and down so far. Yeah, there is the ellipse, and there is the tangent line at that point on the curve. What would the normal line be? Well, it goes through the same point AB, but the slope is minus one over C, the negative reciprocal. So that should be the normal line. And if here, I also plot the normal line, fantastic. Let's see, let me just change this. That's not so spread out to the two. There we are. Here's the ellipse. This vertical line, and not vertical, but this line going up rapidly with negative slope, that's the, the tangent line at this point, and perpendicular to it is the normal line. So we've done a fair amount in this lesson, and this is as far as we will go today. Let's just go back and double check, review what we did. So I defined the fractional part and the integer part or the floor of a number. And as an experiment, we calculated for the number three halves, A is equal to three halves, what the fractional part looks like. And you can see it jumps around the unit interval. Um, if we wanted to know how many of these, <clears throat> if you look at the fractional part of three halves from one to a hundred, how many are in the, first, in, the unit, in the first half of the unit interval between zero and a half? Well, this was a little program to count them. Actually from this, let's say, let me go back to a hundred. That's one to a hundred. What happened here? Ah, I know. So, first of all, this was my number A. I had erased everything a moment ago. So if I count the number up to 100, it says 73. I'm a little suspicious about that. In fact, I'm very suspicious, but just go back and look. So I let A be 1.5, three halves. So the fractional part is a half. And when you start taking its powers, you know what you get. And these were the fractional parts. And this list, the fractional parts, less than a half. Of the ends for which that's the case. And when I count them, ah, 51, just about half. And okay, so then there are two new commands today. Implicit differentiation, when a function y of x is defined by an equation, you can obtain the derivative implicitly by this command an implicit plot. When you have a curve defined implicitly by an equation, you can plot it with implicit plot. And that's what we did. Well, that is the lesson for today. 
and with that, we will stop. <laughs>